So hi, everybody, and everyone who's online. That's the, we were just talking about the joys of a tech crowd. We've got is a big crowd online. Uh, so I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the president of New America, uh, and this is our panel on the costs uh, of the NSA's surveillance on Amer the American economy, but also foreign policy and really the internet itself. So. Here at New America, we've been doing work uh, on surveillance, on NSA surveillance, from the perspective of our national security program. Uh, I was just at a conference in Munich where someone asked uh, the German head of intelligence and one of the American participants about the paper that New America put out showing that in 250-odd cases uh, of suits or prosecutions of terrorists, these are public, uh, NSA uh, intelligence was de minimis. Now, obviously, there are cases we don't know about, but in the cases we do, we were able to go through each one, look at all the evidence, and say, you know, really, these people were apprehended by much more traditional uh, methods. Uh, and uh, the conclusions of that paper were endorsed uh, by the president's own NSA review group uh, on, and also on the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. So today we're moving from the straight national security uh, perspective to the costs of NSA surveillance uh, much more broadly. So there's the cost to every individual taxpayer, uh, which some people have estimated is $500 uh, per year. Uh, as we're approaching April, that's quite a lot. Um, it's also clear that big American businesses like Cisco or HP or Qualcomm or and actually even Boeing are experiencing really significant fallout uh, from the Snowden revelations. And there are some experts, one of whom is on our panel today, uh, who have estimated that the NSA scandal could ultimately cost the American internet industry tens or even hundreds of billion dollars a year uh, in the next few years. So. There's the straight economic costs, but our panel today will also be talking about the foreign policy costs. And here I have to say I have a direct stake uh, in the sense of our overall foreign policy goals. One of the things we did uh, when I was working in the State Department for Secretary Clinton was to advance an internet freedom agenda, talking about the right to connect, uh, the freedom to connect as a fundamental human right. Uh, that was the week we announced, her speech was the week after Google left China to avoid Chinese surveillance. Obviously, these revelations put us in a rather difficult position uh, advancing uh, that agenda. Uh, but equally importantly, in terms of thinking about internet, internet governance, and we have all been thinking about the implications of the balkanization of the internet if Brazil or Germany or other countries decide we are going to regulate our own internet. And that seems unthinkable to many of us, but sadly history tends to show that things that were initially free, I mean, we have the freedom of the seas, but even the freedom of the seas is then encroached on by individual uh, countries. Countries uh, for, for a range of territory. And finally, there's the cost to the internet itself, uh, to the, the danger that the NSA has acted in ways that weaken internet security standards uh, and that create or exploit a whole range of vulnerabilities uh, in, a, in internet services uh, and products, uh, and that that then will change uh, the basic or threaten the basic open architecture uh, of the free and open and secure internet uh, that we have been, all of us, everybody in this room has been working to build. So today's panel uh, brings together experts who will talk about uh, both the economic and foreign policy implications of the issue. This is also the beginning of New America's uh, deeper dive uh, into the costs and the benefits of the intelligence community's uh, conduct and a broader inquiry into how we preserve basic American uh, values and our interests uh, in a period of this kind of, of deep and rapid technological change. So to moderate our panel, I want to introduce Kevin Bankston, who's, I'm still proud to say, our new policy director uh, at the Open Technology Institute uh, here at New America. I'm going to uh, embarrass him a little bit just to say 
when he was a younger civil liberties attorney, although to me it's hard to imagine he was younger, but uh, in his previous life as senior counsel at the, uh, the uh, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, he actually filed his first uh, lawsuit over NSA bulk surveillance over eight years ago, which is really before it was cool. Uh, so he, he brings uh, a wealth of experience uh, to this issue, and it's my pleasure to introduce him to moderate the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. Thanks to everyone in the audience, both in real life and online. And thanks especially to the excellent um, group of panelist experts who will be walking us through the Snowden effect uh, on the U.S. economy and foreign relations and on the openness and security of the Internet. Uh, last week, some of you were here for an event we did on the cost of surveillance from a different perspective, talking about how cheap surveillance is, how changing technologies is actually making it very inexpensive to conduct more and more surveillance on more and more people. Um, but this week, we're talking more about the other cost of surveillance, the cost to us and to us as a society uh, of these surveillance programs. <clears throat> so uh, the program, as it were, uh, each of these panelists is going to spend about five minutes uh, giving their perspective on the issue, give or take. Then I'll be asking questions for a bit, and then you'll be asking questions for a bit. And then uh, we'll end with a small reception, and I apologize to those online who uh, we can't give wine to. Um, but so let me introduce you to our panelists. Uh, those of you at home, please be ready at Google to, uh, at the Google bar to uh, search for the things that I'm going to mention, because I'm going to mention a few pieces of writing that several of these folks have done. Um, first off, Daniel Castro. Uh, he's a senior analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, or ITIF, and he's the author of the very oft-cited uh, study, How Much Will PRISM Cost the U.S. Cloud Industry? And I'll give you one guess as to what he's going to talk about. Um, money, 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 uh, the straight economic costs of the NSA programs. Um, we have Ross Schulman, senior analyst, I'm sorry, public policy counsel at CCIA, which is the Computer and Communications Industry Association, which by its name, you could guess, is a trade association um, representing a wide variety of internet and communications companies. He's going to be talking mostly about the impact of the Snowden revelations on ongoing debates about the future of the internet, not only uh, how it is to be governed, but how it should be designed and built out. Will the Snowden effect turn our internet into a splinternet? Ross will tell us. Richard Fontaine, uh, president of the Center for a New American Security, his team recently wrote a great Reuters opinion piece on the fallout from Snowden called NSA Revelations, Fallout Can Serve Our Nation. He's going to focus mostly on how the Snowden effect has disrupted the U.S. government's foreign relations. I'm sorry. Um, He's going to, I'm sorry, he's actually going to focus on how uh, the Snowden revelations have disrupted the U.S. government's international uh, internet freedom agenda that Anne-Marie mentioned, and what the future of internet freedom looks like in a post-Snowden world. Uh, Mike Oyang is the director of the National Security Program at Third Way. She's written a couple of great pieces recently, uh, one for the Boston Globe, to judge NSA reforms, look to the tech industry, and a Forbes piece. NSA snooping's negative impact on business would have the founding fathers aghast. Uh, she's going to talk about one other cost, which is the cost to our diplomacy and our foreign relations. And she's also going to talk, based on her experience, uh, her longtime experience uh, working the intelligence beat on the Hill, about the failure of policymakers and the intelligence community to consider all of these ranges of costs when actually developing policy. Um, on that note, I'm going to actually give a shout out to a friend and colleague, Alan Friedman, who's currently a GW visiting scholar on cybersecurity. He wrote a great piece for The Atlantic on this same topic called Why Wasn't the NSA Prepared, i.e., why weren't they prepared for this kind of fallout? Um, speaking of folks from local universities, our fifth and final panelist, uh, Micah Schur, uh, is an assistant professor of computer science at Georgetown University. He, with 46 other technologists, recently signed on to comments to the president's review group on the NSA's activities, uh, raising concerns about NSA's impact on internet security and on security standards. Um, like those comments, Micah today is going to focus mostly on the cost to everyone's security uh, of the NSA undermining encryption standards and otherwise planting or exploiting security vulnerabilities in everyday devices and software. So um, with no further introduction, because there's been a lot of that, um, let's get started. Daniel. Great. Uh, thanks, Kevin, and, and thanks for doing this event. I think it's, um, it's sadly still timely, even though it's uh, been so many months. Um, I, I think it's you know, important to kind of take a moment and, and reflect back where we were a year ago. Um, 
a year ago, if you were to ask anyone, really anywhere in the world, who the leaders were in cloud computing, the answer would absolutely be the United States. Um, in fact, people did ask this question, and they, they did answer that. Uh, and if you asked who is likely to be the leader in the future, they would have also said the United States. And I think if you ask that same question today, uh, by and large, you will find people saying, you know, I, I really don't know, maybe Europe, maybe Latin America, um, you know, we don't know. And the reason we don't know, of course, is because everything that's transpired over the past eight months. Um, you know, when PRISM came on the scene, it was this, you know, big news story. I mean, I remember where I was when I first started, you know, seeing all the headlines trickle in. And, you know, we knew immediately that this was going to have an economic impact. We didn't know what it would be, but we knew there was going to be an impact. Uh, and we knew this for a few reasons. One, uh, everyone was angry, and they had a right to be angry. Um, and two, we'd already seen that Europe and Latin America and Asia, a lot of these regions were competing very hard for cloud computing and, and kind of what the next wave of tech uh, was going to be. If you look at the, um, you know, all the uh, estimates of where the growth was going to be, if you look at tech overall, it was like, you know, 2% or 3% a year. If you look at cloud computing, it was going to be 100%. I mean, it was this, this huge, you know, disparity between where the growth was going to be um, and, and where it wasn't. And U.S. was the leader in that. U.S. was ready to capture it um, in 2008, or 2009, excuse me, it had four-fifths of the market um, globally, right? Okay, so you know, then the revelations come and, and people start saying, well, what's going to happen? Um, everyone's angry. They start saying, you know, can we trust the United States? Can we trust the United States with our data? We've had these conversations before, um, especially around the Patriot Act. We knew that other countries have been using this argument for a long time, but suddenly they had a trump card. Suddenly they had something very clear to point to and say, you know, this is why you shouldn't you know, use Google. This is why you shouldn't use whatever. Any U.S. company, you know, insert the name there. And, and so, you know, we, we started to say, okay, what might the economic impact be? Um, so what we tried to do, you know, it's not a prediction. What we tried to say is if we see a loss in the foreign market share, what would that translate to in dollars? Um, so we looked at two scenarios. One, a kind of, uh, a, a, you know, more conservative and one a little bit higher. So uh, the two estimates were if we saw up to a 10% loss in foreign market share. So assuming none of the U.S. growth was lost, it was only in the foreign market share, um, and that would be accelerating, not 10% in the first year, but, you know, starting small and moving up to 10% over three years. That would be $22 billion. If we went up to 20%, that would be $35 billion. The kind of basis for those numbers was that uh, the Cloud Security Alliance, which is a a professional association of security professionals did a survey of their members. This was in July of last year, kind of uh, late July to early August, um, asking both U.S. and non-U.S. professionals how the Snowden revelations impacted their decision. Uh, so 10 percent of non-U.S. respondents said they had canceled projects already. This was in the first month. 56% uh, said that they were less likely to use U.S. products, again, of foreign respondents. Um, of the U.S. respondents, 36% said that, yes, this would definitely make it harder for them to sell their products. Um, and this was in the first month. This was when people were still trying to figure out what was going on. So, you know, our estimate was kind of on the 10 to 20% side. Again, over three years, uh, we felt this was very conservative. Of course, Cloud Security Alliance, I mean, this was not a scientific survey, and these are of people who are, you know, kind of paid to be paranoid. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is kind of within the realm of reality. Uh, so then, you know, the kind of the question is, well, you know, what's transpired since then? Um, part of the reason we wrote this paper was to, because we wanted this to be a wake-up call, to say, look, this will have a serious economic consequence if the U.S. doesn't respond. And, and we know other countries are going to, uh, one, you know, take certain actions and they're going to be scared away just in terms of uh, buying these products. But two, uh, lots of countries are going to use this as leverage to uh, block out U.S. companies. Uh, and, and the U.S. needs to respond. The U.S. needs to have a forceful response. I don't think we've seen that. We, you know, we can talk about that if anyone else thinks we have seen that from this administration, but I don't think we've seen that yet. Um, I think repeatedly we see companies saying, we're the ones out on the front lines defending this. Um, and you know, the reality is the companies can't change the situation they're in. Um, you know, look at a situation like Target that's hit by this big situation, you know, big kind of external event. They can kind of control that, right? I mean, they could have had better security. Responding going forward, they can say, we're going to implement these controls. U.S. companies can't solve this problem, and that's, you know, that's the biggest challenge right now. The people who are suffering, the companies that are suffering, 
they don't have the capability to change it. Um, so I don't want to drag this out too much longer, but just in terms of, you know, have we seen more of this? Yes, we have. So uh, I think, you know, this was mentioned, uh, Boeing canceled a, a four and a half billion dollar contract with Brazil for fighter jets as a kind of direct Brazil. result of this. Brazil canceled with Boeing. With Boeing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Cisco uh, CEO, this was uh, last quarter, talked about lower quarterly earnings in China. Again, he said this was a direct result of this. Um, you see kind of signals on the other side. SAP, which is a German company, has talked about higher than uh, expected returns on their cloud computing business in the last quarter. Um, there was a Swiss company that, again, cloud computing talked about 45% higher uh, earnings. And this was in the first months after that. And I've, you know, I've heard from uh, you know, just since writing this paper from uh, companies kind of all over the world. And I have heard from a number uh, outside of the United States that say, yeah, we, we are already seeing this, uh, you know, advantage our companies. We're using this to market our products uh, and we're getting more business than we expected. So um, I know that the challenge is we don't have more data yet and that's what we're going to be looking forward to in the, uh, I think, months ahead. Um, but we are seeing evidence already. Great. Um, mind if I ask you a couple of questions and we'll pepper between questions between folks? Um, so you did this study, which has been cited everywhere, uh, uh, and there was the Forrester wrote about your study and projected it might be even higher for a variety of reasons. Um, but other than that, we haven't yet seen a lot of studies on this issue in terms of projecting or, or trying to gauge the loss. Um, we did see a, a really neat study that wasn't much reported on from Pier 1, which is a uh, a, a cloud host in Canada, and they did a survey that found that uh, of UK and uh, Canadian customers, 25% of them were already planning on moving their data out of US providers. But I'm curious, how, why haven't we seen more studies and, and how can we get more studies or what would those studies look at? I, I'm you know, looking at, say, Brazil, and one could imagine they are using this as an excuse to go with another vendor, or you can look at Cisco, and it may be that they're using this as an excuse for why their, their sales are, are dropping. How can we actually more accurately gauge this Snowden effect and put it into dollars? Is that even possible right now? Or is the fact that companies are hesitant to you know, be very direct about what their losses are too big of a hindrance right now? Yeah, I, I think there's a few problems. One, certainly um, you know, no company, and, and this is, I think, a, a serious challenge, not just kind of academically to understand the size of the problem. Companies don't want to be out there saying, hey, you know, we're taking a hit. Um, it's, it's not good for uh, you know, their stock prices. Um, but the problem is that creates the, uh, you know, uh, this political vacuum where the groups that we need to have out there pushing this forward. I mean, if you look back at uh, you know, the clipper ship, the reason that that was politically successful in, in getting this shut down, I think, was because we had the entire tech industry saying, um, one, it, it, it wasn't something they were selling yet, so they weren't saying we are losing this market. But they're saying we can't go into that market. And they were the ones that lobbied and, and got that shut down. We don't see that now because companies can't be out there because of the, the dynamics. Um, so we don't see, we don't see that. Uh, you know, the second part of this is, that you know, when I did the study, I was originally looking at just cloud computing because that's where we had the data and that's where we would likely see the, the big impact of what we knew at the time. Of course, since then, we've seen a lot more, as uh, uh, Michael talked about, I mean, you know, so much on, on the security side where it's implicated the entire tech industry. So this was just looking at, at you know, cloud computing, but it's really now you know, any, uh, any American tech company that's selling a product uh, you know, from, from keyboards to you know, storage They've been implicated in this, and a foreign buyer is going to, you know, take a second look about whether they can buy that from another supplier, um, simply because of everything that's come out about what the NSA has done or might have done or could be doing in the future. Um, that there's a little bit of risk there and uncertainty, and that uncertainty, you know, clouds everything that happens. Thanks. Well, so a bunch of the big American companies are are not yet willing to say we're losing X amount of dollars about this, but they are starting to get engaged in the reform. Uh, process and debate, particularly eight of the big companies, including Google and Microsoft and Facebook, in an effort called Reform Government Surveillance. Many of those companies are also members of the CCIA, uh, represented here today by Ross Shulman. Many of them, yes. yes. Um, so uh, Daniel gave a great overview, I think, of sort of like dollars and cents kind of uh, talk, uh, talk and, and I wanted to kind of build on that a little bit to talk about one aspect that you didn't necessarily touch on, but that's related to sort of the actual money. And then, and then I also want to talk about sort of uh, you know what we what we call at CCI the soft power problems. But um, but the the economic issue is actually is trade, and, I, and it kind of wraps up into what you're saying. But but I wanted to put a pin in the in the idea that 
this is having an absolutely an adverse effect on the trade efforts that the USTR is engaging in abroad. And so CCI has offices in Geneva where we do a lot of work on trade. And, um, and so I just want to kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, so the Boston Consulting Group um, predicted that across the G20, the internet will contribute $4.2 trillion to GDP in the year 2016, so in a couple years. Um, and, and, kind of, and McKinsey has pointed out that of that economic value, 75% actually accrues to what you might call old school enterprise, brick and mortar, just the, the efficiencies that the internet trade brings along create GDP benefits. And that's you know, across, again, the G20. But you know, this, is, this is also a worldwide phenomenon. However, all of that benefit is really rooted in, in a question of, of trust. And, the, and actually, the White House recognized this all the way back in 1997. They put out um, a report, kind of the first report on internet commerce. And there are pages, and in, in, uh, one particular uh, kind of paragraph that we like to talk about talks about the, the root of internet commerce as, as being a trust issue. And it's not too much to say that the, the NSA's programs and the NSA's um, and the revelations about those programs have absolutely struck at that root um, of trust, particularly with U.S. programs, uh, for, sorry, particularly with U.S. companies, but I actually think that it's, it's safe to say that there are problems along these lines with governments around the world and that U.S. companies are not going to be the only companies that are kind of implicated by this. So that trust is absolutely harming uh, trade as well. Um, the U.S. obviously has a huge amount of uh, exports in sort of the digital services realm, um, and we're now seeing com uh, countries basically trying to use the trade <coughs> structure to combat that superiority as much as they possibly can. They're doing it in, by, by fighting back against free flow arguments. We're seeing Brazil do this with local hosting requirements. I think you were talking about that a little bit. Um, but there's, uh, there's definite sort of uh, trade impacts there. Um, and, those trade and, those, and, and those trade impacts are, all also, are also fighting back at sort of the end-to-end -end nature of the internet. Local hosting requirements will do this. Routing uh, requirements, you know, um, Brazil uh, basically trying to create uh, internet routes that are, least, are, are less efficient but do not traverse U.S. links. Uh, and also creates uh, problems with kind of end-to-end -end, uh, structure of the internet. So just a little kind of note on, on trade as a part of the dollars and cents argument. Um, but I also want to talk about the sort of non-monetary um, non issues that, the, that these revelations have had. Um, <coughs> and they, they accrue in a sort of, uh, in a constellation of eff uh, effects that we're sort of talking about um, as U.S. soft power problems. So the, the U.S.'s ability abroad to influence um, diplomatically s issues uh, having to do with the internet, right? So, uh, Emery, you talked a little bit about um, sort of the open internet that you, uh, efforts that you guys uh, ran while you were at the State Department. Immensely helpful. At the same time that you were working on those, there were immensely, immensely important internet governance questions happening as well that, that uh, some of the same offices there were working on. So um, for a long time, the U.S. was a leader of a, of a coalition of countries around the world that were fighting against government control over internet governance and fighting for the multi-stakeholder model that has, up to now, um, really kind of dominated how the, the internet ran itself to a large degree. And the U.S. had a lot of partners in this, most of Western Europe, large portions of Latin America, portions of Africa as well, and were fighting against a number of authoritarian, mostly authoritarian regimes, Russia, China, Iran were kind of the big three, but they had friends as well. Um, and those countries would much rather see governments basically run uh, the internet uh, on their own accord. Um, and this all sort of came to a head in December of 2012, uh, when, which is when most of the rest of the world sort of woke up. The State Department had been watching this for quite a bit longer. Um, but with the, with the WICKET, or the World Conference on Inter International Telecommunications, that happened in Dubai in December of 2012, I was, uh, I was there as a sort of a member of the U.S. delegation on behalf of CCIA. And we saw a real schism between the, those Western countries that I talked about and, and the sort of this other block of nations that would prefer to see governments run the internet. And this was 
basically the end the, the question ended up being you know is the is the multi stakeholder model going to continue to be the operating uh, the operating model or are we going to move to something much more like the international telecommunications union which is a multilateral government approach that likes to pretend that it's multi stakeholder but doesn't do a very good job of it frankly um, and so up and through June of last year the U S had a excellent hold on the leadership of this sort of, uh, of this conglomerate of nations. But since then, we've seen a real fracturing in that sort of unified front. And we're seeing a lot of Western Europe pushing back against the US, not in saying that they want governments to control the internet, because that, that, that's not really what they want. But we're seeing them take the approach that they can no longer really work with the US and therefore our, our unified front is, uh, has been compromised to a certain degree. And then we're seeing regions of the world that used to at least be willing to hear us, such as Latin America, such as Africa, and be willing in, in portions such as Brazil to, to really kind of hear what we're saying, um, now, now turning away from us and, and the, the work that we had been doing up through 2012 and up through just last year has really been set back by quite a bit because of these revelations of what the NSA is doing. So that's uh, you know, another area where re we're really sort of trying to claw back the, the good work that we had been doing. And, and you know, we're going to see next, uh, not, no, not next month, but in April um, in Brazil for the Net Mundial meeting that Dilma Rousseff has, has called you know, what the new state of play is. But, um, but we are definitely have some harder work ahead of us to do. Thanks, Ross. So, I mean, listening to that, and, and uh, it seems that in many ways the NSA programs <coughs> are actually leading to uh, negative impacts on the idea of a free and open internet in at least three ways that I can count. Like, first off, there's... Um, there's the impact on the internet governance debate to the extent that what we have done is now undermined our position in terms of preserving a more open multi-stakeholder process for governing the internet. Um, and then second, the sort of technical level of that, which is governments wanting to enforce sovereignty over their internet, whether through requiring local data storage or hosting or re-architecting the actual infrastructure, uh, which are actually, we've seen a lot of proposals of the, that kind prior to Snowden, and often it was for the express purpose of enabling government surveillance, you know, for example, around BlackBerry and India, um, or enabling government censorship because data that is stored locally is easier to block. Um, and, then, and then third, uh, we're also seeing the undermining of our position in the sense of, remember the old uh, 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 drug commercial, not, not commercial for drugs, but anti-drug commercial, I learned it by watching you. Um, you know, there's this, I think, this problem of now countries can actually look to our practice and say, well, look, the United States, this, the paragon, supposedly, of, of rights and internet freedom is actually, you know, engaging in massive surveillance. Why can we not do the same uh, within our own borders? Um, but that's all leading up to a question, which is, we're seeing a number of different proposals in response to the Snowden uh, revelations in terms of the architecture of the internet, but I'm trying to figure out how do we judge which of them actually make sense and are good and which of them are problematic. So for example, Brazil. We have Brazil one and it's Marco Seville proposing data, requiring by law local data hosting, which we are concerned about from a free flow of information point of view. And yet we also have the announcement yesterday of a new cable between Brazil and Germany, which actually seems to some extent a good thing. It's building out the internet. It doesn't, it enables, you know, instead of all the South and Central America traffic having to go through Miami, you know, it allows a direct connection. How do we distinguish between what is good building out of the internet and what is bad restricting or re-architecting of the internet? So it's, it's an interesting question and, and I'm not sure that I have a 100% answer. One interesting thing I, that I think, one interesting point is that the example you gave for the what might be a good thing has actually been in the works for a very long time. The Brazil Europe cable, and I think it actually will touch Africa as well, has been in the works for a long time. And, and it's been, it, I think maybe something happened this week. I am honestly not sure what it was to bring it back into the news now. And it's been framed as a reaction to the Snowden revelations. But it is inherently a good thing too. Like Brazil 
the, the transatlantic cable across the southern portion of the of the ocean is a great idea and it should absolutely be done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I guess one question is, you know, if you take away the rationale, the, the reactionary rationale, is it still a good idea? That's yeah. one way that you can look at it, and, it, and that's and that's not a bad idea. I think the other the other question is that, you know, if you on the surface of it, will it break the internet? So local hosting requirements, to a certain extent, break the internet. And you know, a, a new cable from Europe to Brazil doesn't break the internet. It makes the internet more, more robust. It's a good thing. It's more, it makes it more resilient. Um, and so, even if the only reason that Brazil was trying to land a cable from there to Europe was to avoid landing in Miami, that would still be a, mm -hmm. a, a, a net result good thing for the internet um, in terms of resiliency, in terms of robustness. The same thing goes for um, you know, lo building local internet exchange points um, in countries, even if they're only doing that. So the reason that a lot of traffic goes through Miami and then back to Latin America is because the Latin America, American countries up until recently did not have their own internet exchange points where the ISPs within the country could peer with one another. They had to go to Miami to peer with one another, so traffic would leave the country, go to Miami, and then come right back to the same country if you were trying to go from one ISP to another. Now, that they're building local exchange points. They might be doing it so that they don't have to go to Miami and tra transit the US, but even if that's the only reason they're doing it, it's still a good thing because ISPs are inherently good things. So I think that that's at least one way to, to analyze it. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, next up, Richard. All right, well, thank you. and. Uh, Thanks for uh, having me here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the internet freedom agenda that the United States government uh, began to put in the, into place, starting uh, with the Bush administration, but really accelerating uh, when uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State in, in the Obama administration, which I think for a variety of reasons, one of which is the, the Snowden revelations, uh, has, has really uh, taken a back seat to, um, to in, in comparison with what we as a government have tried to do before. Um, this panel is about the cost of, of surveillance, whether it's data localization or the internet freedom agenda or privacy or uh, international relationships and so forth. I should make clear that I, I believe that there's some benefits to surveillance as well. And um, it, I think it's, uh, it, it, it has to do with uh, counterterrorism operations, but it's not only that. And I think it's been something of a mistake to frame the benefits of surveillance only in a counterterrorism framework. Um, surveillance and the, and the information that is collected through surveillance as with intelligence collected through other means improves or at least has a potential to improve the quality of national security decision making and foreign policy decision making whether it's on trade or, or, uh, in, or interstate relations or any manner of, of uh, national security decisions. The question now I think is how do we balance the benefits that surveillance brings um, against the costs once those uh, programs become public, as they have done in such a, um, in such a dramatic fashion. Um, and to think back um, on the internet freedom uh, agenda just a couple of years ago, uh, we as a government were in a position where uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton gave uh, four speeches while she was Secretary of State uh, on internet freedom and its importance in US foreign policy. She really elevated the cause of promoting uh, the, free and flow, the free flow of information online uh, to be a, a key element of, of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, she compared uh, the freedom to connect to FDR's four freedoms and added a fifth saying that this was, you know, so in the pantheon of freedoms, this was an important thing. <coughs> the, um, the House of Representatives and the Senate both established global internet freedom caucuses to try to promote this thing. And there was a, uh, several pieces of legislation um, pursuant to this effort. Um, the State Department, the Broadcasting Board of Governors uh, was funding to the tunes of several tens of millions of dollars per year uh, circumvention uh, technologies, encryption technologies to allow uh, dissidents and others to communicate uh, effectively and, and outside the, uh, the watchful eye of, of uh, foreign governments. Um, and as was just mentioned before, at places like the ITU and other places, the United States had a very forward-leaning role to try to keep the state hand off of the um, the governance of the internet in, uh, in order to preserve, um, again, this, the multi-stakeholder model which would enable the free flow of information online. I'm afraid that since NSA revelations, um, much of this is, uh, has essentially gone off the rails. Um, Secretary Kerry, uh, at least to my knowledge, has given no speeches on internet freedom. Um, the, uh, one of the technologies that was uh, being funded um, by the U.S. government uh, was TOR. Uh, which would allow people to, to communicate uh, in uh, encryption, uh, using encryption. Uh, it came out that while part of our government was funding TOR, the NSA was trying to crack 
tour. So uh, you had sort of two efforts going on um, at the same time. Uh, it has been reported that uh, efforts within the UN General Assembly to um, pass a resolution that would enshrine the right to data privacy has been opposed by the U.S. government, although to my, uh, to my knowledge the government has not actually made an affirmative case for if that is the position of the U.S. government, if so, why and how this fits in. And more than anything else, and as folks have alluded to before, I think we've, sort of, we've really lost the narrative here. Um, uh, the United States uh, was in a position before of pointing to the Russias and the Chinas and the Irans as the bad actors, and now we're having this thrown back at us. Uh, we're in a position of saying, well, it's illegitimate for the Chinese government to surveil Chinese citizens, but it's legitimate for the U.S. government to surveil Chinese citizens. Discuss. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, you know, and, and actually, you know, and, and to be clear, I, I think that there are ways of, of, of parsing this, and, and there's logic behind some of this, but as a narrative, it's an extremely difficult uh, thing when, when you're engaged in is primarily a diplomatic enterprise aimed at persuading people that they should embrace um, a model that, uh, that promotes the free flow of information online. Um, so we're seeing this sort of pushback um, against uh, the United States and, and, and frankly some uh, inactivity by the U.S. government, which on the one hand is understandable if you're uh, an advisor to uh, Secretary Kerry, um, probably the best way of getting thrown out of his office is to suggest he go give a speech on internet freedom right now. Um, but by the same token, and as I'll discuss in just a second, I actually think that that's the kind of thing that we need to be doing more of, not less. Um, I'll offer just a couple of points uh, for where we go from here. Um, and I think the, the starting point of departure um, needs to be that surveillance is going to continue in many of the forms in which it, it, it takes place uh, today. It may be more tailored. Uh, there may be more oversight uh, by the Congress or others. There may be more transparent. But um, I think in Barack Obama, you have uh, the president in at least recent memory um, who is uh, the most uh, uh, likely to uh, find uh, ways to tailor uh, surveillance programs. And um, I think you're not going to see a, a president, Republican or Democrat, um, give up these surveillance programs. The bulk collection uh, issue is, is sort of a separate one, but certainly the surveillance of, of foreign nationals. Um, so if you start from the point of departure that surveillance is going to continue as, as uh, governments uh, do, um, although it may change, um, and then you have to stipulate that this is going to be an extremely difficult enterprise given all to, to sort of push the internet freedom agenda forward uh, given uh, the challenges and the loss of the narrative that I uh, described. I think that uh, one uh, starting point would be for senior U.S. officials to begin explaining the U.S. government's approach uh, to internet freedom and how all of these things at least conceptually fit together. Um, so why uh, or how is the U.S. actually tailing or modifying its surveillance programs and how does that actually fit with a vision of where the internet is going and the free flow uh, of information online? Where does the United States come down on uh, international privacy rights? Do such things exist? Where do we think about these things? Um, will the United States continue to use various instruments, whether it's technology, uh, provision, diplomacy, trade agreements, public pressure um, to advocate for free and, uh, and open internet? And fundamentally, is this still a U.S. foreign policy priority? Um, we, there was, as I said, there was so much talk about this uh, just a couple of years ago, and, uh, and there's very little of it today. And then, and then finally, I would just say that I think uh, within the government, uh, there's a real need to um, unify decision making um, that uh, in, in which uh, choices about surveillance on the one hand or uh, the future of the internet, whether it's internet governance or these kind of broader internet freedom issues on the other, um, where these decisions are being made, it's my sense that um, they're, all, they're often be being made uh, without um, any unifying vision of what this is actually going to do in aggregate. So for example, if you're making the decision a crack tour while you're making the decision a fun tour, is that actually a decision that the government made, or was it a decision that two parts of the government made totally independently um, and maybe didn't even know that the other one was necessarily doing this? Um, and, uh, you know, so if you're going to make decisions about um, surveillance and you want to take into account the true costs uh, and benefits and how this is going to uh, influence decisions made on the internet freedom agenda, and I think both people, uh, both sets of people have to be at the table uh, at the same time. You have to unify that decision making in a way that hasn't been the case thus far. So a few thoughts on the internet freedom agenda. Thanks, Richard. And I'm, gl I'm glad you brought up the example of Tor because it's a very clear example of 
we are funding tools for internet freedom while at the same time funding breaking those tools for internet freedom. And actually, my friends back at EFF have a great graphic showing like a terrorist using Tor and an activist using Tor, and they're basically just wearing different hats. <laughs> um, but I have a question for you that was prompted by your comments, but I'm actually going to want everybody's input on that. So I'm going to ask that question when we go to full panel. Um, Mika Oyang from Third Way. Yes. Um, so I want to talk about one of the other costs to uh, the US as a result of these Snowden revelations. And then I want to talk about why these costs aren't considered in the process and maybe how they should be, in, in part to answer Richard's um, suggestion. Um, one of the other costs that we see as a result of Snowden revelations is the increased difficulty of the United States in conducting diplomacy, not only on the trade front or on the internet freedom front, but generally. We had, as a result of the Snowden revelations, that we had been tapping the cell phones of current uh, of foreign leaders. The cancellation of a state dinner, which is a rare thing and an important bilateral relationship building tool between the US and Brazil. We had outrage from a very important partner at NATO in the form of Angela Merkel being upset about what she was talking, uh, that her phones had been tapped. Um, and you see quieter, less noticeable outrage from other European countries. Um, some of that outrage is real and will have short term, cause short term difficulties for the United States in the conduct of its foreign policy and its ability to get other leaders to do things that the United States might want them to do. Um, and then you have long term implications for what it means for the United States, which is seen as a beacon of freedom and not conducting business the way that Russia and China do. Um, as conducting surveillance on foreign nationals, you will have a generational problem where we have, will have lost the moral high ground. And that is something that we are going to have to deal with as diplomats for many generations to come, that we don't have the same uh, cachet in the world. We are not the same beacon of freedom that we once were before these, these revelations. And that's in part because we have conducted surveillance internationally in a way that is seen as overbroad. I think everyone in the world benefits from United States surveillance efforts. Our surveillance efforts to catch uh, terrorists around the world have led to the disruption of plots on every single continent with the exception of Antarctica. Uh, many people benefit from the tips that are generated from our surveillance. Um, a lot of commerce benefits from that too. You've heard or seen reports of you know, disrupted package bombings. Well, those companies really benefit from American efforts to, to disrupt those programs, um, those, those efforts. But at the end of the day, you have this outrage in part because of domestic political concerns in places like a unified Germany where the East Germans had conducted surveillance of their own people. The sensitivity to surveillance is much higher. In places like Brazil that don't have the same aggressive international espionage efforts, you see real outrage there because they don't do it to other people, so why would people do it to them? That's a real challenge for us, especially with Brazil, because of its increasing influence in international debates. Um, so we are really going to see challenges with that over the medium term. Long term, we'll have to deal with a, an image problem. Um, now I wanted to talk about why it is that the United States government is so bad at taking all of these costs into account. And both on the executive branch side and in Congress. Um, starting with the executive branch side, when you have the United States government looking at decisions like cracking TOR and funding TOR, part of the problem with the intelligence community is that it conducts itself so much behind the walls of secrecy that it does not want to discuss with anyone who is not appropriately cleared what they are doing. And that throws huge swaths of policymakers out of the room when they are making decisions about what kind of intelligence collection they are going to do. And so one of the recommendations that the President's review group said was that you've got to bring policymakers into that conversation. Now this cuts against the grain for the intelligence community who's fundamentally paranoid about the more people who know, the more people who might leak. Given the kinds of leaks they've had now, perhaps they should just assume that things will eventually leak and they should get the policymakers in the room to have that conversation on the front end. Um, but it is a real challenge for them because they're hindered by the secrecy. Um, the other problem that you have with the policymakers is that they are often not technical experts. The conversation that we have had here in many ways goes over the heads of a lot of policy experts. They don't understand the architecture of the internet. They don't understand the way that encryption technologies work. They don't understand it well enough to make deci informed decisions about what it will mean to the internet and internet growth. You see this in, indeed, in some of the ways that even inside the US government they have explained 
the way these NSA surveillance programs work to each other. Oftentimes you have legal experts making calls on whether or not a surveillance program, bulk collection or not, is the right thing to do and consistent with the law. As a, law a lawyer myself, it doesn't mean that you have any special technical expertise in understanding the vast quantities of data that are coming in, the filtering mechanisms, or any of the rest of that. You're really ill prepared for that, unless you have a strong technical background. And so a lot of times people are talking past each other in those discussions. It's a real challenge. And if you think that the challenge on technical understanding is big in the executive branch, it is even worse when you get to Congress. Former Congresswoman Jane Harmon said most members of Congress only encounter technology through their children. They <laughs> barely know how to use their Blackberries. When I was on the Intelligence Committee, I had to try and explain to members of Congress what a botnet was. And it was like, the attacks are coming from inside your computer. Like, they just didn't understand sort of how these things work. And so getting members of Congress who are on average quite old not part of an internet generation, um, to understand the way the technology works and the way that in which it's evolving to make rules, to set oversight guidance for the intelligence community is very difficult. And then in addition to that, the members of Congress have an imbalance of information with the executive branch. They don't, the intelligence community doesn't like to share with Congress. They play a little bit of a game of 20 questions, you know, is it bigger than a bread box? Um, if you don't ask exactly the right question, you may not get an answer that will allow you to fully understand what's going on with the program. And you've seen that in some of the ways that Congress has offered legislation and the ways in which that has been interpreted and the ways that some members of Congress who passed things like the FISA Amendments Act or the Patriot Act are now saying, that's not what I thought you would do with it. Part of that is the imbalance of information between the executive branch and Congress in understanding these programs. The other thing is that in intelligence, unlike any other area, Congress doesn't have the benefit of outside experts. People don't know and can't comment, write op-eds, reports like the ones at New America or at CNAS about what's going on in, on intelligence programs. And you have that in every other area where the best minds and the expertise of an entire field are brought to bear on this. On intelligence, you don't know. We particularly ran into this problem when dealing with cybersecurity. We we wanted to go and talk to industry, and we went around to try and find people in industry who understood what the government was doing about cybersecurity initiatives. And it was incredibly difficult to find people in industry who even had the requisite clearances to understand what the government was talking about in cybersecurity initiatives. And then knowing the level of information that the government was giving them, they didn't feel really comfortable judging those initiatives. And they said, look, we have technological fixes that we would recommend and ways that we would engage this debate, but we just don't feel like we have enough information here to advise you well. That would never happen in the Judiciary Committee, on the Science Committee, in Ways and Means, on taxes, or any of these other things. But this imbalance of information means that you don't necessarily have the best quality debate on intelligence because it's just the members and the executive branch inside a closed room. In addition to that, you have jurisdictional problems. The executive branch will narrowly say these 215 programs in the Patriot Act, we're only talking to the Judiciary Committee about them, even though they're being conducted by the NSA. Or these overseas collection programs, we're only going to talk to the Intelligence Committee about them and not the Foreign Affairs Committee about them, because they're the only ones read in. So you have a bifurcation of the understanding within Congress and a bifurcation of the expertise amongst the committee staff and how they're going to approach these issues. So unless we're going to talk about some very serious reforms where people are more willing to share, which the intelligence community hates, you're going to continue to have this problem of balkanization, of oversight, um, which leads you to a, a worse policy outcome. Thank you for an incredibly depressing and cogent <laughs> criticism uh, of the state of affairs. Um, a, a, a question. In regard to the first half of your comments about the impact on foreign relations, you know, one one point that's been raised, and certainly I, I know that this is a feeling inside of the administration right now, is likening the people who are complaining uh, about surveillance of their leaders uh, to like the captain in Casablanca who comes in and goes like, "Oh, I'm just shocked, shocked that there's gambling in here." Like when really everyone is is doing it or trying to do it. Like, does that should that impact the debate, or is it? frankly, beside the point, uh, considering where we are. I think that it, it, they have a point, right? Like the conversation that was leaked between our ambassador to the EU and our ambassador to Poland about how she really feels about the EU. Um, 
that was not done by us, obviously. There are other countries out there that have the ability to tap phones and put those conversations out there into the world in a way that is damaging to diplomatic relations. We're not the only ones who are listening to people's phones. So there is a little bit of everybody does it. The challenge for us is that we are perceived as holding ourselves to a higher moral standard. And so when we do it, people are more upset. People expect it of the Russians. They expect it of the Chinese. I don't think they expect it of the United States. So we should be honored that they're that angry, actually. <laughs> it's, it's also worth adding that, um, we, so we, we're hold, held to a higher standard, and, and I think it's also partly that we're actually phenomenally better at it than most of the rest of the world do, um, yeah. both through accidents of history and also through kind of our drive to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, just by accident, a lot of the traffic of the internet routes through the U.S. because we did it first. DARPA was the one who kind of put it all together to begin with. So that gives us a, a, a leg up over, you know, the Ukrainians if they wanted to try to build a, a, a SIGINT infrastructure. Yeah. There is an element of jealousy in this, right? We spend more than any other yeah. country on surveillance. Our capabilities are better on, than everyone else on surveillance. There's a little bit of like, maybe if they could, they would too. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also think there is an irony, uh, you know, I have a map in my office of where all the cables are that was left by my predecessor. And uh, there's just like solid red of pipes going through the US. And there's nothing like that anywhere else on the planet. But I think that in part because of this, you're going to see that changing a lot. And in many ways, it, you know, going back to Richard and talking about the value of intelligence, we might have a situation where we're, by trying to overexploit our, our privileged position, we're going to be killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. And we're going to see a lot of people routing around the US in a way that ultimately degrades our intelligence capability. But um, you raised a couple of other really in incredible points. I, I, I really like the idea of needing to probably just assume that things are going to leak either, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, maybe faster and having contingency plans ready for that. Um, in terms of the difficulty of keeping secrets in the age of the computer, I, I highly recommend a book uh, mostly about WikiLeaks by Andy Greenberg called at Forbes called uh, This Machine Kills Secrets, the machine simply being computers. Um, it's a really great book. You also, you know, talk about something that a lot of folks in DC are thinking about right now, including here at New America, which is how do we build and maintain a pipeline of actual meaningful technical expertise into the policy making process when we're basically, we're on the wrong coast and we don't pay enough and we're not <laughs> sexy right. like Facebook. Um, and it's an incredibly difficult problem getting, you know, the, you know, the tech expertise in the room, which is why I'm so happy to have Micah here <laughs> um, to bring some tech expertise into the room. Thank you, thank you for, uh, for including a, a technologist on this panel, and hopefully this won't be the last time that you do that. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the uh, implications to internet security as a whole uh, due to the, um, uh, the Snowden leaks. And, and one of the points I wanted to make uh, from the get-go was uh, there's this um, tremendous push, both, both publicly and privately, from the federal government over the last 10 years or so to really strengthen our cyber infrastructure. Um, and one of the lar largest surprises to me as someone who studies computer security on a daily basis from the Snowden leaks was how much of our infrastructure relies on systems that have been purposely backdoored by our own government at the same time we're trying to make those systems uh, more secure. And that, that, that frightens me as an academic and as someone who uses these uh, uh, systems on a daily basis. Um, so our infrastructure relies on these systems that we know have backdoors. Um, and I think that um, there's been um, a lot of attention to kind of the um, sexier aspects of, of the Snowden leaks, but there's been too little attention to what's been going on uh, in the crypto community or what the implications are to the crypto community. Because it's a little bit dry, but I think it's incredibly important. So um, one of the programs that's been exposed is Bull Run. And as part of the Bull Run project, um, it's really the NSA has been trying to purposefully weaken encryption standards. Uh, and they've done this, they've done this successfully. Um, a, a case in point is, the, uh, is a pseudo-random number gener generator, and please don't fall asleep quite yet, <laughs> called uh, Dual EC. And, and this is why this is important. And I'm, and I'm, I promise I won't make this into computer science lecture. Uh, in a, in, if you're encrypting, if, if two parties are encrypting, um, they need to come up with a good key. And if you have that key, then you can decrypt the conversation. So the security of the system depends entirely on how good that key is. It's just like a door lock. If you have a lousy key, um, then then the door won't then the, the lock won't uh, be all that uh, all that useful. 
So by backdooring a random number gener generator, and these are the tools that are used to produce these keys, what happens is we have very poor keys. So uh, if you use this particular random number generator. So in other words, you have the world's best lock, but the locksmith keeps on giving you the same key over and over again and gives that key to everybody, which means that effectively you have no security. So this is what the NSA did in a particular pseudo random number generator called dual EC. It wasn't viewed as, uh, well, uh, this wasn't a particularly popular random number generator. Um, it was known to be flawed, both in terms of um, its security and its performance. Uh, it was recommended as back as 2004, 2007, excuse me, to not be used. Uh, but it turns out through the, re through the uh, Snowden documents um, that, uh, or, or it came to attention, I should say, that RSA in their BeSafe library used it as the default pseudo-random number generator. generator. So what this means, um, stepping back, is that any system, software, or hardware that uses this particular flawed backdoor piece of um, math uh, is effectively vulnerable to uh, wiretapping or surveillance. So it doesn't matter you know, um, what the system does. If it uses it, then it's flawed. And this has um, uh, implications to us in, uh, throughout our internet in terms of our routers and our softwares and the systems that we use uh, because of the popularity of, of these systems that depend on these flawed, sy these flawed um, uh, generators. Um, the NSA um, has, has come out, or not come out, uh, it, it's been revealed, I should say, uh, that they regularly have the capability to break, to break SSL and TLS. This is the protocol that um, secures the web. Anytime you type in HTTPS on your browser, um, you're using SSL or TLS. They have um, some capability to reverse that. So uh, e-commerce, banking, um, encrypted chat, uh, virtual private networks, uh, encrypted VoIP systems, presumably like Skype. And they do so by doing things like forging digital certificates. And again, I won't go into the technical details, but this is problematic because at the same time, um, academia and just security experts in general are really trying to move companies towards using crypto because we view it as important. You know, things like HTTPS Everywhere is a wonderful project that the EFF runs, trying to get sites to adopt SSL so that you know, when you enter your username and password, it's you know, secure in, in, in theory. These systems rely on the very systems that NSA are purposefully and successfully trying to, uh, to backdoor. And, and, and that's problematic both from a technical standpoint um, and from the uh, standpoint of just weakening confidence in, in these systems. Um, there's also an effort to not just attack the crypto, but to attack the systems themselves. So, so programs like PRISM that uh, taps into data centers run by uh, Google and Facebook, S systems or programs like Muscular that taps lines between uh, uh, data centers. Um, this is problematic because it creates an architecture where surveillance is part of the system by design. And that just mean, means that our communication ar architecture is much more complex than it needs to be because we have all these additional interfaces. We have the problem of not just securing communication between two parties, now we have to secure communication most of the time except when some other person comes in and taps and that's okay if they're the right person. And getting, just getting Alice and Bob or the two parties to talk to each other securely is hard enough and we barely know how to do that. When you add the complexities of adding um, surveillance capabilities to these systems, um, you introduce by necessity vulnerabilities because you, what you're doing by, defini by definition is introducing backdoors. And, and this isn't just a, you know, a um, hypothetical problem. We've seen these systems fail. Um, like the Greek, for example, the Greek wiretapping uh, scandal in 2004 where um, using um, uh, attackers were able to leverage um, law enforcement wiretap capabilities in Vodafone Greece to wiretap on the, uh, on the Greek prime minister for a number of years. Uh, yesterday it came out that um, in, in Turkey this uh, widespread wiretap abuse by the police there, again uh, wiretapping on their prime minister, again using these interfaces that are built in for the purposes of conducting legal, legal I'll use air quotes, legally authorized surveillance. I'm not a lawyer so someone can tell me whether those are, are, are appropriate uh, air quotes. So um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sum up by saying that um, as, a, as someone who teaches computer security, um, 
w w and, and as a computer security person, we're not very good at our jobs. We have plenty of mistakes. You can read, and every, every day you can open the paper and read it about the next target, the next vulnerability. Um, we're, we're getting better. We're building more secure systems. Um, and uh, we're coming up with architectures that are inher inherently more secure. But at the same time, if our efforts are undermi undermined by, um, uh, by introducing backdoors into crypto standards or um, introducing additional interfaces that um, weren't originally in spec, that just leads to a, a much less secure communication architecture. Um, and so if, if we're going to really be you know, achieving our goal of making the internet a much more secure place, what we don't want to do is we don't want to make it surveillance friendly because that is um, kind of the, the polar opposite in terms of security. What we want to do is we want to be contributing to the, uh, uh, to the research and to the systems that make these uh, our, our architectures more secure. Great, thank you, Micah. I, I mean, this sort of goes back to what Ross was saying about the, the, the root of trust in the internet, and when you undermine the security of the internet, you're undermining trust that the internet will actually securely transmit what you, you want to transmit. Um, but we've also seen a degrading of trust between, because of these interventions by the intelligence community, between the companies and the government. You know, and Muscular is a good example. This was the program to tap the data centers, tap the lines between the data centers of Google and Yahoo outside of the country. Um, and that was when the companies really got publicly angry uh, in combination with a few exploits of Apple products where you had Microsoft basically calling the NSA an advanced persistent threat, usually a term reserved for like China or other uh, other state hackers. Um, you know, Apple, Apple basically calling the NSA malicious hackers and some not publicly sanctioned Google engineers basically saying F you NSA for tapping our stuff. Um, We've also seen a degradation of trust in the security community. This week is RSA, uh, the conference of RSA, that, that security organization, um, and a lot of people have boycotted the conference or are attending a counter-conference um, in response to RSA's role uh, in using this default number, default compromised number, random number generator. Um, and this is an issue that hasn't been gotten, hasn't gotten a lot of attention, even though the NSA review group brought it up in a couple of recommendations, actually, because I'm a nerd. When I read the report, I then tweeted, these two are my favorite recommendations. What are yours? And they were 29 and 30, which were all about the importance of encryption, the importance of not undermining encryption, um, the importance of not allowing the government to mandate uh, backdoors into products, and finally, the importance of the government disclosing the vulnerabilities it finds, something, something that's often called a zero day. Uh, a term for an exploit that has been discovered but not reported, uh, or that, that has not been widely discovered. Um, so that's actually my question for you, and uh, not to put you on the spot, and if you don't have a great answer, that's fine, but I'm curious what your thinking is on how the government should respond when it discovers vulnerabilities or purchases vulnerabilities on this gray or black market for vulnerabilities. Should the government be doing that? What should the government do, be doing with that knowledge? If it has a hacker squad that's discovering vulnerabilities, how long is it okay for them to keep that a secret? Or should they just disclose it to the vendor immediately so that we can patch our stuff? Right, so, so that's, that's a great question. There's um, a, a wonderful study by uh, Mandiant on the, the APT uh, group in um, APT1, the, the group in China, um, that is, is doing something similar. So we know that other, other governments, and this is, you know, should surprise no one, are building repositories or, or building up databases uh, of attacks. So one of the uh, least surprising things to me uh, that the NSA w w was doing was assembling these different, uh, particularly you know, tailored, targeted attacks. I'm actually, um, you know, that that doesn't keep me up so much because those aren't um, uh, those aren't persistent or those aren't um, ingrained in our in our architecture. These are tailored attacks for a particular system. They're not um, backdoors into uh, you know some crypto system that's used everywhere. Instead, it's you know this particular flavor of some application. Um, we know how to target that. So I think that um, there need you know there should be a, I guess balance is the key word. Um, you know there should be a balance of um, uh, whether it, it strengthens, strengthens our ability to withstand attacks from, from outsiders by disclosing these vulnerabilities when they're discovered to, to vendors versus keeping a few of them um, as you know, weapons, if you will. Um, and I don't know exactly where that balance lies, um, but I think that uh, where, where there's a, a solid line 
is when you start um, purposefully introducing either by um, uh, either by uh, interfering with the standards processes that happen with you know, groups like uh, NIST when they come up with new crypto protocols, or uh, uh, when we um, uh, build particular pieces of int uh, crypto or uh, internet architecture and, and, and deploy them elsewhere. Um, those things that are that are ubiquitous and widespread, I think, are you know, certainly well above the line of you know causing more harm and more danger uh, to our networks uh, than they help. Great, thanks. So now we're gonna I'm gonna address a few questions to the entire panel, and whoever wants to answer or has a good answer, throw it out there. And I think the the first and most important question is, what do we do about this? Like, what's what's the appropriate policy response by government? What's the appropriate response by business? And on the policy response by government uh, side of things, I, you know, an additional question. We've seen a lot of reforms proposed. They may or may not go anywhere. Uh, reforms proposed by the president, reforms proposed by the Hill. They all are mostly focused on the bulk records collection um, that is mostly impacting Americans' privacy and don't do very much in regards to the so-called 702 authority regarding wiretapping that impacts people outside the country and does absolutely nothing regarding the government's conduct outside of the country, like you know, under, under executive order that happens without statutory authorization or with FISA court approval. Is that gonna be enough to address the trust gap that we're talking about? And if not, what would? Transparency reporting, like what, what is gonna get us there? Or are we just, are we just screwed? I'd actually like to take issue with something you said about 702 collection, which is that the president has made a very significant change to 702 collection, which has gotten completely missed in the press, which is that the kind of minimization, protection of privacy that we have for American citizens, he has said he would like to extend that to foreign collection. And what that means is that for people who are not bad guys, we are going to take steps to try and protect your privacy. That is a major step forward, and everyone seems to have missed that, in part because no one knows what minimization is in the domestic context, right? Because it's all secret. But it is actually trying to say, look, we can't do everything. We're not going to extend to you the same protections as we have under the American Constitution, but we are going to do something for foreigners. Um, that Fair so enough. We are Fair trying enough. to do something, but because, and this is another problem, because we can't talk about the protections that we will put in place going forward because everything's secret, it is very hard to resolve the trust gap. Even if they were going to change what they were doing on encryption, on zero-day exploits, on other kinds of covert programs conducted under other authorities, he couldn't come out and say, I'm going to stop doing the following covert things. And even if he did, no one would believe him because the whole point of the intelligence community is to like, do stuff that's illegal in the country where it's being done. So you will have a persistent trust gap. I, I think that that's probably true. I think the US government could personally give every child around the world a puppy, and there would still be a trust gap <laughs> um, going forward. Uh, but I think that that doesn't mean that the government needs to be doing some things to address, address the situation. Um, and I think sort of. I think that anyone who says that any one answer is a silver bullet is probably trying to sell you something. Um, I think that going forward, we're going to need a huge combination of you know, lobbying Congress, lobbying the executive branch to change policies, getting companies to implement secure, reliable crypto systems wherever um, is appropriate, and, um, and getting average users to understand their, their own security online and, and, and educate people as to how uh, to use programs like PGP and, and or HTTP everywhere, HTTPS everywhere um, in, in order to kind of get, get the most out of the security online that they can get. But I think it's got to be a multi-pronged effort. It, there's not going to be any one action that you're like, yep, oh, we're done, go home. I, I agree with uh, Mika's um, comments about you have a real problem because you can't be transparent about anything that you do to you know uh, change you can't be very transparent anyway about uh, what you do to change certainly the surveillance of foreigners and then even if you were uh, is that believable so let's take a, a ridiculous hypothetical I mean if the president said all right from now on I will surveil no more than 50 Germans and all <laughs> of those Germans have to be directly connected to Al Qaeda right so no Merkel Nobody works for Merkel, nobody in the government, no random Germans. Um, would that stop 
the German uh, political system from the data localization pressures or for the activism they're doing in the EU Parliament um, or for you know the the idea that there is still out there the big American brother that's that, that has the capacity to look over the shoulder at anything anybody's doing online or, uh, or over the phone um, you know I, I just I think to some degree, the cat is out of the bag here, and we have to deal with the fallout as it is. And there's, I mean, we can affect some of the fallout on the margins, but when you're talking about the effect on foreigners and policy changes that we could make with respect to surveillance of foreigners that would then affect their response, I think it's very limited. So uh, I, I agree with much of that. I would say, you know, the way I would think about that question would be, you know, what would it take to get someone to say, yeah, I want to store data in the United States. Like, I think that's a really good idea. Because I think that's what, you know, basically we had before. And um, I, I agree there's no silver bullet, but I, I do think there are some things we could do. I mean, I think, uh, Kevin, those are my favorite recommendations as well from the report. I think getting um, the U.S. government to be absolutely unequivocal that, you know, the policy is we support security. We don't degrade security. We don't, you know, stick back doors in. We don't promote bad protocols. Uh, one loss that we haven't really talked about is the really the loss that U.S. companies have in the sense that they don't have experts to go to. You know, these NSA experts in, in cryptography and security, they can't tap that resource uh, for two reasons. One, because they're at odds with what they're trying to do. Um, but two, now they can't go to them because, uh, you know, you don't want to be affiliated with that organization. It looks bad for your company to go there. So that's kind of a huge loss. Uh, the second area is, uh, you know, really the idea of uh, digital free trade. Um, you know, you, you talked about this quite a bit. I mean, this is ultimately the goal. Um, when Europe talks about creating a, a German or a French cloud or a European cloud, I mean, that's basically, you know, digital free trade, but just for Europe. Um, we want that for everyone. We want to be able to say, and I think it's reasonable to say, even if we still have surveillance, uh, we have surveillance at the same level as the Germans and, and the Brits and the French. So you can, if you're concerned about where you store your data, you can at least store it with any of us because we're all going to, you know, have the government survey you in the same way. Um, and and the third is is the structural reform. Um, I think, uh, Mika, I think your point's probably one of the most important. That if we don't have this kind of structural change that we're talking about, where you know in the future uh, any decision that's being made about this is being made purely from the intelligence side and not from what's the economic impact, you know. Going forward, we're going to find ourselves here, you know, 10, 20 years from now, and that's what nobody wants. So, how you change that actual part, I think, is actually very difficult. Um, but if you don't get the structural reform, you're not going to have any, you know, lasting impact. I think the, the, the best possible answer to your to your question is like, how do we how do we get back that trust? Is go back 10 years and do it better. It's like it, absolutely all of, all of Mika's talk about the structural reforms necessary and the fact that. The intel people were the only people in the room making this decision. It, I mean, it seems obvious in retrospect that nobody else had any impact on that. Um, is is the reason that we're here right now? I mean, if if they had just thought about it harder um, ten years ago, we might not be here right now. Yeah. Well, one of the things that they could do to restore trust is a recommendation actually the president didn't take out of the review commission, and that's separating offense and defense. Yeah. We have NSA and Cyber Command. Cyber Command, which is responsible for defense together in the same organization with the NSA. And so companies that want to work on securing the internet and making things better are working with the exact same people who are, on the other hand, tr uh, trying to find exploits and trying to undermine the, the security of the internet uh, for very strong national security reasons. But they are the best at breaking in. And then they're also working on securing. So it puts companies who want to cooperate with the government in an awkward position. To separate offense and defense would make it very clear to companies who wanted to cooperate with the government, we're not working with the offensive people. We're only working with the defensive people. So I think, I think this issue has hit um, security researchers particularly hard, this, this trust issue. So NIST, for, um, for, for several years, have run uh, cryptographic competitions where anybody from the world can come in and propose a cryptographic algorithm. Uh, it's openly reviewed. Um, th there's input from the NSA or any re really anybody who wants to, uh, to provide input. And then kind of in this open discussion, uh, a standard is elected. And then people can trust the standard because it's been so well scrutinized. Uh, and what's happened uh, recently is you know, we've gone back and we've looked at some of these standards conversations. And we've seen that, well, you know, this, this uh, 
pseudo random number generator that I you know harp too much about uh, ha ha has been biased. There's other things that have been gone on with this. Uh, it, if you followed it, this SHA-3 um, hash discussion is, is to, you know, whether these last minute changes have been, you know, uh, influenced by uh, the, the NSA. And, and, and really the problem comes down to trust because uh, you have so much expertise in cryptography coming from the NSA and academics and security researchers, researchers in general had to rely on that expertise to, um, to um, uh, to really well analyze a, a, a cryptographic protocol, uh, we can no longer, well, it's more difficult to trust that expertise when we now know that they're funded you know, to the tune of $250 million a year to purposefully weaken the cryptographic uh, standards that we have. So how, how, you, you know, how you repair that um, is something that, you know, as, as, as an academic, um, uh, and I follow, this, I follow this pretty closely, um, it, is an extremely difficult problem, and it really just deals. You know, the the best solution has just been making this uh, more open, um, and uh, there's been you know pushes to move some of the standards work to Europe, which is probably not a good idea, certainly not from the, the U.S.'s perspective. But to f figure out how we can do this in a more open standard and, and get some of the uh, get the trust back from all this expertise. Uh, that, that we have at the NSA. Y you mentioned kind of in your early remarks that most of the technical expertise in the country is in the West Coast. I'd agree with that, except for the crypto expertise, which I think is squarely placed in Fort Meade. Yeah, Virginia, yeah. Um, I have one more question, then we'll go to the audience. And it was actually a subpart question, which is a good example of why you shouldn't ask multi-part questions. Um, we've talked a lot about what the government should do. The companies, we've seen a lot of movement from the companies. We've seen unprecedented things. We've, we've seen Apple, Microsoft, and Google sitting down in a room together and agreeing to do something together uh, with five other major companies in the, in the form of this uh, reformgovernmentsurveillance.com effort where they've put forward a bunch of uh, surveillance reform principles and they've now hired a joint lobbyist from uh, the Monument Group uh, to help visit on the Hill and supporting the USA Freedom Act. They've been aggressively pursuing transparency reporting in an attempt to restore trust. We've seen a number of them acting very quickly to encrypt their, their uh, uh, data links. Many companies that had not had HTTPS turned on before are now finally turning it on. What else should they be doing? And do we think that what they're doing now is, is the effective path forward? Uh, they seem to be definitely trying hard to do whatever they can to restore the trust gap that, that's, that's arisen. But I'm curious if there are any other ideas about you know, what should they be doing? So, well, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say. I mean, I think it's also important. To know, so th they're certainly doing all the things that that you mentioned, um, and I think that's a that's a pretty comprehensive uh, approach. Uh, and but I, you know, I, I do know that that they don't think they're done either, um, and that the 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 reform government surveillance group that you talked about is um, ongoing. It's it's growing. They're adding companies. I think um, they added one just last week, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, but. Um, but, uh, but and, and they're looking for kind of other ways to be effective too. So um, I don't think they're sort of washing their hands and saying, oh, well, we did our part, let's go home. Um, and so, but as to, as to what else they could be doing, I'm, I'll have to think about that. I, 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 I was gonna say, I, I think that the particular group of companies that you've talked about have been very Silicon Valley focused. And Congresswoman Anna Eshi, who I've worked for, um, has been very engaged in the debate and has been concerned about tech's impact um, in these debates for a very long time when she was on the Intelligence Committee and has been very aggressive about that, but she's been a lonely voice. Silicon Valley's had a very standoffish attitude towards Washington, and part of it is engaging with Washington to explain what they do. But then it, this is also beyond Silicon Valley. I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times article earlier. Uh, it was in January where they were talking about radio transmitters and pla uh, placed into computers. Um, and it was interesting, one of the things they said was they are sometimes inserted aftermarket, sometimes unwittingly, and sometimes with the part of the, on the uh, with the help of a manufacturer, any company who is thinking about cooperating directly with the intelligence community on a particular program needs to pass the front, or think about the front page test, which the review group talked about. What does it mean for their stock price and their shareholders if it winds up on the front page of the New York Times or some other paper that they were in bed with the intelligence community to do this? No American company wants to be in the category of Huawei. And so th from a company's perspective, as much money as the United States government might dangle in front of you, you need to think very carefully about what it means if that 
program were to become public. So I think that that's, that's a really good point. And, and you talk about the money. And I think it's really interesting to, to think about not just the carrot, but also the stick that the government probably comes to these companies, which, which is, you know, we don't have right now a terribly good sense of what the law permits the government to demand of a company vis-a-vis -vis inserting back doors, inserting, you know, here's a chip, don't ask any questions, um, you know, don't tell anybody that I was here kind of meetings, right? So um, there's a huge vague area in the law right there that I don't think anybody has an answer to right I mean, now. And, and I'm sure the NSA is exploiting the uncertainty around that in some of those meetings probably. And that, I mean, that points to one thing we can add to the list, which is litigate more. Yeah. Um, you know, we know now that Yahoo challenged uh, the FISA Amendments Act predecessor statute, the Protect America Act, in front of the FISA court. We've seen other companies, including Yahoo, uh, fight back on law enforcement stuff like access to email without warrants and the like. And so, um, and we've now heard Twitter somewhat, somewhat rattling its saber about the possibility of bringing its own case about transparency reporting and their First Amendment rights, presumably, hopefully not in the FISA court again. Um, but Anyone else? I would just add on the internet freedom front, um, I think the, the companies clearly have, have, have played in the past and have a, a role to play in the future that's very important, whether it's through the, glo uh, the Global Network Initiative or, or other um, private sector efforts. But even more than that, I think um, the companies uh, have a, a role to play in pushing the government uh, out of its defensive crouch, which has been in on the internet freedom front for a while, and it can't remain in forever. If you actually think this stuff is important as a foreign policy measure, then there has to be, they have to work uh, to, to bridge uh, what's going on between the government and the private sector in order to elevate this um, in the sort of pantheon of foreign policy issues that are, that the government uh, officials care about and that we're promoting abroad and then figure out what role they can best play through stuff like GNI and other, um, and other uh, efforts like that. I just said, um, you know, there's, I think the companies can also uh, work to remind those outside the country of, of the impact of some of the um, policies being put forth. So, you know, for example, uh, EU companies, you know, the, the tension here is that, you know, so uh, Deutsche Telekom, I mean, they might benefit from a data localization policy, right? But every other company in Germany that you know, manufactures or that exports and wants access to the best technology, they suffer because they have to pay more. And, and reminding that there's these trade-offs. So when Brazil has, you know, a, again, you know, a data center localization, so they're maybe getting construction jobs. Well, who's not getting them? It's their neighbors, right? And so reminding that there are these consequences, um, I think is useful, that it's not this kind of static system, that it's this dynamic system. And if, if you make one move, someone else will make another. And let's play out what the consequences will be. Great. Um, are there any any questions from the audience? Oh, quite a few. All right. We've got a gentleman with a mic who will, uh, please. Um, thank you for this, sorry. Thank you for this discussion. Um, I have a quick comment and then a question, uh, both of which are addressing the notion of adding cost to the discussion of the revelations. One is the initial comment that you're surprised that more people haven't uh, commented on the costs before. Um, if you look back at things like data breach laws and economic analyses, short term and long term, often a very high economic impact long term tends out to be nothing. Uh, I'm sorry, short term ter tends out to be nothing in the long term. So for instance, a stock price might drop, but over time it gets back to where it was before. So. It may simply be that the economists are waiting a while to see what the long-term implications are before they, they do their analysis. Uh, my question is that I haven't heard you discuss anything about the revelations in terms of the volume of data that the NSA is now looking at and the costs to individuals in the sense that the number of false positives and negatives of their predictive analytics means that far more, orders of magnitude more, people are getting caught in a net they don't even know exists and it may be preventing them from doing things that they need to do um, because of this increase in volume. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I, I actually uh, read an article 
two weeks ago maybe about a woman from Malaysia, I believe it was, who was inadvertently put on the TSA uh, no-fly list. Um, just someone ticked the wrong box uh, at one point back in the, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. And she had to sue the government and went through, you know, months and months and months of litigation and who knows how many dollars to get off that list and, um, and finally be able to, f to fly again. And, uh, and all just because of a clerical error that the government refused to cop to. Um, and so you're absolutely, that's, yes, there's absolute costs that come from just inadvertent m mistakes when you deal with that much information. And also the simple cost of that massive, massive data center in Utah yeah, that right. they just built. This gentleman right here. Henry Farrell, George Washington University. Um, I wanted to ask a question about a train wreck which is maybe coming, uh, which is maybe visible at the moment, which is the European Privacy Directive, which is currently under negotiation. Uh, originally, there was a clause which was going to provide U.S. companies with some protection uh, if they gave information to the U.S. government for uh, security reasons. That clause was removed after the Snowden uh, revelations. Now, uh, the uh, current text that has been prepared by the Parliament suggests that U.S. companies could be fined up to 100 million dollars, or 5% of their global, or 100 million euro, or 5% of their global turnover. Uh, by a European data protection officials for failing to comply with European data privacy law, which presumably would be the case if they did provide information to uh, the U.S. government. What kinds of options does the U.S. have or do, do U.S. business have faced with this potential threat if we see uh, maybe 18 months, two years from now, the directive goes through and the worst case scenario uh, for the U.S. at least is realized? Someone speak to the EU data protection debate? Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I, I think the answer to that is that we will we'll have to wait and see what the European justice ministers of the individual countries uh, end up saying to their commission counterparts and their parliament, European parliament counterparts. I, I have a very hard time believing that that provision will not be reinserted into the final draft. It's such a fundamental piece of data protection and privacy law that when a, gov when a government arrives with a legitimate order, a warrant signed off on by a judge that the company is, is uh, absolved of uh, civil penalties for turning that over to the government. Um, and so I would be astounded if if that wasn't reinserted, and if it isn't reinserted, it'll be, it will be ignored. I, I think there's a real cost to Europe of actually instituting that provision. Uh, one of the things you could see is American companies say, okay, I'm not going to share the information. If I go into compliance, I'm not going to collect this information I don't share with the U.S. government. If it turns out that an American company had access to information about a terrorist plot, and they didn't share it with the American government, and they didn't share it with anyone, and people died, then I think the European privacy commissioners are going to say, at what price privacy? And you see this debate happening all the time in the United States. At what point are we willing to give up some of our privacy in the interest of security? And American intelligence helps people around the world disrupt plots. So I think they're going to have to figure out a way of getting around that because the intelligence services in the host nations are not going to want the flow of data to stop. Next question. Hi, um, David Sturman, a research assistant here. I'm interested in whether the, um, whether there's any potential for increased transparency on the question of what the plots that have been prevented abroad are and whether that would make any difference to the economic impact. The plots that have been referenced in terms of the 215 collection seem to have been overall debunked by a multitude of reports. And there are lingering questions raised by some reporting on even the 702 and broader question of whether plots were prevented by that. Um, is that, are those questions affecting investment and can that be changed? Yeah, I'll um, take a crack at that. I mean, the, to repeat something I, I said at the beginning, I, I think the to frame it uh, to frame our surveillance uh, programs solely in 
as a counterterrorism measure is the wrong way to think about it, and it doesn't reflect the reality of why we do the vast majority of our surveillance efforts. I mean, counterterrorism is an extremely important um, motivation for surveillance, and surveillance, uh, whether it's been um, the U.S. or passed to other um, governments, has uh, has resulted in disrupted terrorist plots, but lots of the intelligence that we collect through a variety of means, including through electronic surveillance, is not aimed at terrorism. It's aimed at all kinds of other things, preventing nonproliferation, improving um, our knowledge of uh, political and economic affairs in a particular country, um, gaining insights into the decision making of uh, foreign governments, um, multinational crime. Um, I mean, there's a whole variety of reasons why the United States, like every other country in the world, engages in intelligence collection activities, and terrorism is just one of them. So I actually think, you know, insofar as the administration wants to frame this as we, we do this so that we can stop terrorism, it's going to be a losing argument because, you know, some of the stuff's going to be debunked or people are going to say, well, do you really need, you know, uh, to you know build this data center uh, in Utah and maintain telecommunications records until the end of time? That every American, every you know, every text message I send to my wife, you know, everything, all of this is all about terrorism. I, I just don't think it's going to. It's just not going to line up uh, in the right way. Well, a follow-up question on that. I mean, I, t I take your point that number of attacks prevented is not the ultimate judge of the utility of you know signals intelligence. There are a lot of a lot of reasons to do signals intelligence and a lot of benefits that can come from it. But at the same time, isn't terrorism the justification for the changes in the law that have allowed these programs? I mean, the Patriot Act was a direct response to a terrorist attack on American soil. Indeed, you know, the, the program that prompted the passage of the FAA, the FISA Amendments Act, the president called it the terrorist surveillance program. I mean, aren't these programs being justified based on the supposed utility in countering terrorism? Well, I, I mean, I think you have to disaggregate what's happening at home and what's happening overseas. I mean, that is not true of what's happening overseas. Surveillance overseas has been fair game, you know, forever. Um, and, and we assume that the same thing is true uh, with respect to other governments surveilling uh, Americans uh, of interest to them. Um, and, and that was what I was thinking of more. I mean, the, um, the, uh, to, to justify uh, the surveillance programs, particularly of the overseas surveillance, on terrorist grounds, that, that is what I think is, you know, essentially a losing argument. Uh, it's a different question when you're talking about the bulk collection at home and the programs that have stored, that have come into, into life since 9-11, which, yeah, you're right, were fundamentally rooted in, in, the, in the, the aim of disrupting terrorist plots, but I think you just sort of disaggregate those two things. Mm -hmm. 702 actually has three purposes for which surveillance is permitted. One is foreign intelligence collection, one is wrong. terrorism, and one is WMD. Pre uh, proliferation prevention. So they do talk about all those three. And then one of the other purposes for which, you know, other countries are seeking information on surveillance from us all the time and would seek this kind of data from American companies is for legal purposes. If a country is going to try and prosecute some of its own citizens, they think, oh, we want to get the Gmail accounts of this these folks who are running an organized crime ring in Sicily or something like that, they're going to come to Google and there's a MLAT process by which they can ask for those those requests, but to the extent that they make it more difficult for American companies to collect that and make it more difficult for them to share that with our government, what is the process for those com countries when they want to go and prosecute their own people? There's a whole question about MLAT reform that we haven't even touched on. David Sullivan with the Global Network Initiative. Uh, thanks, Richard, for the shout out to our yeah, work, which no brings together uh, tech companies with NGOs and investors and academics working on freedom of expression and privacy online. Um, I also have a uh, comment and a question. Um, my comment is uh, in response to the question of what more companies can do, and just to say that I think um, the more that the companies, particularly the reform government surveillance uh, coalition as that's moving forward, can also work together with civil society and the strong grassroots kind of uh, movements that we've seen in reaction to the NSA surveillance, um, the more effective they can be both on the Hill and in the international debates on these issues. Um, my question, though, which builds a little bit on um, the most recent comments, relates to the fact that most of the substantive proposals for reform that are being discussed here in the U.S. right now really relate to those uh, programs concerning the bulk collection of uh, U.S. metadata and the questions around the constitutionality of programs uh, surveilling U.S. persons, 
Um, but the bulk of the worldwide concern and indeed the economic kind of questions for the companies we're talking about today relate to the surveillance of uh, non-US persons abroad. Uh, and my question for the panel is how do we stitch those two things together um, and how do we start to address those international concerns um, in the discussions that are going on here about what to do next? So first, intelligence officials need to stop saying the Constitution ends at the water's edge, right? Like that's, it, it may be legally true, but it's not a helpful thing to say in the context of this debate. Um, and I think people need to talk more about what the president has proposed on 702 minimization, that we will extend similar privacy protections to people outside the United States as we do inside the United States because we believe in the values of privacy, the right to be left alone. Um, People don't talk about that enough because you know, in the American media it's much easier to talk about bulk collection and the rights of American citizens because frankly foreigners are not buying American papers or clicking on American websites or whatever that now the newspapers are dying. Um, but I think that we need to talk more about what it means as we conduct these activities overseas and, and there hasn't been a lot of ink spent on that. I I think, it, well, it's time at it, this point in the panel for somebody to disagree with someone else. So I think, <laughs> okay. I think I'll give it. I'll I'm give just going to disagree with yourself. All right. I, well, maybe we'll disagree from different perspectives. <laughs> I'll give it a shot anyway. Um, I, I think that there's uh, some danger in mixing the, uh, the, 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 the so-called rights that, that foreigners uh, have uh, sometimes invoked since the Snowden stuff happened against surveillance by the United States and the rights that actually do exist uh, in America uh, for people protected by the Constitution. When you start to mix the language, the way you talk about these things, uh, you know, I was in uh, Germany a couple of weeks ago and, and guy uh, said, you know, everybody in the United States is focused on whether the bulk collection in the United States um, is uh, an infringement on the rights that Americans have uh, to not be surveilled by their government. Um, and, you know, we foreigners have rights too. Well, where are those rights enshrined? Like what document actually says that, that I as an American have a right not to be surveilled by the government of China? I, I mean, is there an international covenant? I mean, last time I checked, there was the no international covenant on civil rights. <laughs> says that you can't be surveilled <laughs> by the government of China? Well, not in that many words, but <laughs> well, what is this? well, well, but, it, but it, I mean, espionage is an internationally accepted uh, international practice, which has been conducted by nation states well, just Since because the beginning of time. Well, yes, that, that is and, true, but that doesn't mean that it's an it's accepted practice. In fact, it's against the law in every country. No, th well, it is against the law if you find that the surveillance, I mean, American surveillance of Chinese is against the law in China because the right. surveillance, but that's the, domestic law. The same way law. if we caught, if we caught a, a Chinese citizen here, we're not going to pat him on the head and say, oh, well, I guess that's okay, thanks. Right, but we, we, don't, we don't believe that we have some right that we are, we should be free as, you know, government, our government officials should be free of, uh, or, or must be free of surveillance by foreign governments. In fact, our government officials believe that they're being surveilled <laughs> all the time by foreign governments. So Richard, well, I think but this is a difference of legality and policy, right? It's not in the Constitution that they, foreigners have rights. But the United States as a leader in the world holds itself to a certain standard and says, we believe these rights are universal and we think that people should, they should be extended to others. And therefore, as a matter of policy, we will extend certain protections, not all of them, to people. That doesn't mean that, that a German citizen could come to the United States and sue and say, you did not properly minimize collection against me under 702. They wouldn't have a right to do that. But it's a matter of the way that we lead the world to say to people, we were not going to do certain things against you, I think is something that this this country should do as a global leader. Do you think that foreigners have a right to not be surveilled by the U.S. government? Well, I don't know. I don't think. What do you mean by a right? Because people mean, so well, I don't know. An inherent, I don't believe there is one. An inherent, an, well, but so there's inherent human rights. There are written out constitutional rights that, the, you know, the government shall not blah, blah, blah. And those are two very different things. I think the second one, you're probably correct that, you know, people, foreigners do not, at least under current constitutional Supreme Court inter interpretation, foreigners do not have a Fourth Amendment right, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the first one, necessarily. I'm not saying that they do, but, you need to, but, but, but we need to define but what we're if, talking but about. If there, but if there's a human right not to be surveilled, then we should stop our surveillance practices. 
Well, I mean, the question is, how do you define surveillance? At this point, I'll, I'll go ahead and... Um, well, at least I, I successfully <laughs> disagreed. <laughs> All right. Well, no, I, I, that, was my, that was my... That was my well, 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 I'm going to say, uh, there is actually a document that was published shortly after the Snowden Affair, but that, that was being prepared before that, called the uh, International Principles on the Application of Human Rights to Communication Surveillance that was developed by international civil society to make the case and to articulate um, human rights-based principles around around surveillance, regardless of where you are or what nationality or, uh, and basically reaching the conclusion, and you can find that at necessaryandproportionate.org, because a couple of the foundational concepts in human rights around surveillance is that it needs to be necessary and proportionate. And the basic gist of, I think, their argument and, and mine and perhaps Ross's is that bulk surveillance of anyone is not necessary or proportionate, uh, regardless of whether you're in America or outside of America. But, um, there's a wide, wide variety of opinion on that, and uh, maybe we'll discuss it over a beer. <laughs> well, it seems to me this is a part of a broader discussion that you haven't even raised here, that the um, government surveillance uh, as, as uh, encapsulated in the NSA's activities is part of the erosion of the privacy uh, rights, both in the United States and abroad, uh, by all sorts of organizations, particularly in the commercial sector, where enormous amounts of information is now being uh, pulled into databases and analyzed. And, uh, and uh, I think the Electronic Research Information Center has talked about this. Uh, Privacy International, which is based in London, has talked about this uh, happening worldwide. To what extent do you think the, the feeling that I think many people have now that uh, privacy is slipping away in all sorts of forms has laid the fertile ground in which the NSA's activities could take place and even be exposed without an enormous sense of outrage by the public in general. I know there's been outrage expressed, but by the public in general, it's been surprisingly, it seems to me, surprisingly accepted. Uh, you, taught, you made reference to, oh, it's in order for us to have security, we have to, we have to give up certain privacy rights. Uh, there is, there, I had a conversation just last night with someone who actually said that to me. Well, we, I w had some family who were in, in um, the Twin Towers, she said. And, you know, we have to give up uh, some of our privacy rights in order to be secure. And I think this is, goes to, uh, if you want to download the Apple app, you've got to sign the I agree to that 50-page uh, list of uh, fine print. To what extent do you think we we as a country are now prepared to sort of give up much of our sense of privacy, both to security and to convenience for all sorts of uh, online activities? So can, can I add a question? Is it permitted to add a question to the, the, the <laughs> question? Because, I, I mean, I, this is a really uh, important question, I think. And um, part of it, and I, and I don't have the answer, which is, but <laughs> everybody else probably does. Um, which is, you know, we give up our privacy, obviously, not just to the government, but to corporations all the time. And so when it comes to things like the bulk collection, one of the uh, proposals for reform that has been put out there is, well, the government won't hold on to the data, then, you know, uh, AT&T or Verizon or whoever will hold on to the data, and the government could subpoena the, the, and get this. And to me, this seems, you know, I don't know if that's a perfect answer for a variety of reasons. I mean, one, at least in theory, uh, the government is accountable, right? It's accountable to the Congress and to the, the law, and if you don't like the government, you can change it every four years. Um, and, and, you know, you have an oversight mechanism which could be improved or, or whatever. With, with private companies, none of those sort of built-in things and the, and the fundamental accountability is to the shareholders. So do we want uh, private companies to be the repositories of an indefinite amount of data going forward forever um, that is then uh, available for uh, someone else's use. And I think that this sort of dovetails with the question um, this gentleman posed because I think, you know, we, we look at privacy both from the government's perspective and from the corporate perspective. And I don't have the answer to that, but I know you guys. I have an answer to it. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, maybe. We'll, flip, we'll moderator. flip roles Well, I, I, uh, um, I, I, I definitely think uh, it is not preferable to have the, I mean, we do not want the government bulk collecting this data. We also do not want the government requiring the companies to store data that they would not have otherwise stored, what is often called mandatory data retention, which is something that there was debate on long before 
this happened in a debate that we thought had essentially ended uh, in favor of not requiring companies to store data for a long period of time on the off chance that the government may want to come calling for it. Um, and so I do think that the NSA using appropriate legal process, and I think that's a big debate about what the standards, appropriate standards are, uh, to obtain specific records in specific investigations from the records that the companies would be holding anyway is much preferable to the, to the current status quo. And knock on wood, hopefully, will be the recommendation that the transition group that is studying how to transition away from bulk data collection is, is going to recommend. Because if they recommend mandatory data retention, they're going to have a huge fight on the Hill about it because the tech industry and civil society and many leaders in Congress are, are, are dead set against it and have been for over a decade. I actually think that some of these consumer privacy questions are a red herring in the context of this NSA debate. I mean, a lot of people get really upset, like, why is Google reading my email to put banner ads on the side? And it's a free service, right? If you're not paying for the service, you are not, in fact, the customer, you are the product. And so if you don't want that, then perhaps you should pay for an email service where you are, in fact, the customer. There are very separate questions about what a company does and what their business model is for information that people voluntarily share with those companies and what the company can do with that versus what the government can do with that information. A company is going to try and sell you some things, right? They're going to show you some ads that you click on or don't click on, and that's it. And you can choose to buy it or not. The United States government with that information can stop you from getting on a plane, can put you into detention, or potentially could kill you with a drone. Those are very different consequences than what Google or Facebook would do with your data. Right. You can also you know, go to Facebook and look at their acceptable use policy or, the, you know, in, in theory, uh, y you, can, you can read this information. I hear a lot from, from um, people that privacy is dead, so, you know, why, why does this matter? And I think this kind of goes to the, the crux of your question. And I think that there's a, you know, I, I would agree with you that there's a, there's a huge difference between Facebook is dead because privacy has all of, m because Facebook has all of my information versus, you know, there's widespread surveillance um, bulk scale uh, on the internet architecture. And I think in the first case, you know, there has been concerted media campaigns to educate people, particularly youths, on, um, you know, exposing too much information on um, social networking sites. And, you know, to some degree I can, you know, I, I can cross my fingers and say, okay, hopefully I can educate my daughter that when she goes online, you know, these are the types of information you don't want to share with people or you don't want to sh share online. Um, but what I don't have any faith in is understanding, um, you know, what's been hijacked in the internet architecture. So you know, it, it, when the government does bulk surveillance the way that it's currently um, been revealed to do this is to you know, backdoor systems uh, across the internet as a whole. And so um, in, in doing this, and, you know, and, and the only reason we know about this is because of this noted revelations. So um, uh, how we actually, uh, I, I think the privacy risks from uh, these commercial systems, which we can understand and you know, there, there is some level of exposure to some um, uh, worldwide surveillance system, which we don't understand uh, and we don't really un know exactly what the capabilities are. I think those are two very different things. I would also, I, I think, um, I, I have at least a hope that the premise of your question is not actually correct and, and backed up by, a, I think it was a Pew study from about a month ago that showed that for the first time since 9-11, uh, 2001, uh, a majority of the Americans are actually believe that um, we need to rebalance in favor of privacy over security. So. I just wanted to add, I mean, uh, I, I think the government response to your point has been uh, very misleading. I mean, you know, the president mentioned the State of the Union, you know, big data, and um, in the context of, you know, does it relate to NSA? And I, I think that's, um, it's intentionally misleading because it's conflating two issues that are separate. I mean, the, you know, the government's basically saying, we got our hand caught in the cookie jar nobody can eat cookies ever again. <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the solution. It's not that we keep our hand out of the cookie jar, it's that nobody, you know, and, and so I think, you know, when we're talking about going forward, it's, it's fair if you have, you know, privacy concerns, um, but what the private sector does and the, you know, the rules and laws that it's held accountable for are, you know, different than the government, unfortunately. And so, so this gentleman has been waiting for a while, and, <laughs> but that's gonna, I'm afraid that'll have to be our last question, and then, uh, and we'll be done. At least until the least until Robert Shredda, I'm president of International Investor. We've actually spent the last couple of months uh, interviewing hundreds of um, 
boards of directors and uh, security officials and others, because we do think this issue of quantifying the economic cost of this is very important. Um, we're not sure we're right, but we, we have uh, released a report. We, uh, our, our initial report is proprietary, but next week we're making much of it available publicly. Um, um, so could we'll, you we'll say the name of your organization again? Yeah, that sounds very interesting. International Investor. International Investor. Yeah. And uh, in short, we think uh, there has been some irreparable harm here. And I just want to touch very lightly on, on one or two other things, because I know time's short. Um, when we interview these people, as you know, a lot of the boards of directors are international now. There are no set loyalties to the United States. When they're discussing putting their next R&D centers, uh, they're now looking at international sites mm -hmm. with some of these uh, questions in mind. Law firms that we're talking to now are very concerned about these issues. And what's driving all this is not, not their internal decision making, but their clients, their customers are demanding that they find a location where these very secretive issues and talks regarding their technologies, their research, their legal advice is, is really kept secret as it should be. And uh, I can tell you that you're going to see the economic uh, repercussions for this unfold. So I would say that one of the questions is not just how much privacy will we give up in the name of security, but how much security will we give up in the name of the economy? And on that note, that's a perfect, perfect closing to an event that went, frankly, longer than I expected, but was full of great content, in my opinion. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks to everyone online for watching. Um, and see you next time. Thanks, guys.